I'm just going to welcome everybody to the room formally and informally. Uh, so, and, uh, uh, so I'm Alex and I help organise these events and Ragged University, for those who don't know about it, uh, came together from learning about uh, social traditions of learning and me and a few friends decided, well, it would be nice to, to practice these, but look at the available spaces like lovely pubs and cafes and um, find people who love what they do mm -hmm. to share their knowledge in so, uh, these social spaces. And uh, th this, this, I would argue, is a behaviour that you can find in uh, every culture at every point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the amount of learning about learning that I've done over the years has made my life richer and happier. I would, well, uh, so I, I, I really appreciate these moments where uh, people like yourself, Bing, uh, take the time to share what you've spent your life invested in. Um, so without further ado, um, Bing, please. Uh, yep, thank you very much. And evening everyone, and uh, it's really the first time ever for me not only to give the talk at Ragged University, but also attending it. I did the past several times of planning, but didn't really happen. So this is really the, the quite good opportunity that I'm talking to rather different audience from what I usually face. And uh, one of the things that I just even just like reflecting on what we have, uh, what I have been doing to prepare for this talk, it was quite an interesting journey myself. Just from the idea, roughly the idea I share with family, friends, come to uh, shaping that with some evidence and statistics. It's just like going to my old habit. I don't want to just talk without any base and also looking at uh, what happened in the past. So more and more, I realize to look at the future, I need to look at the past further and then look at the more fundamental things. And this is probably the, the topic we have, I have had the uh, interest since I started my higher education uh, endeavor, like my PhD and into the teaching and also uh, teaching at different institutes in the UK as well in other countries. So, Partially is my personal reflection, but the other part is really uh, observing what is happening around the university, particularly in the UK, and then what should happen. And I keep asking myself the question of what is education, and particularly what is higher education, and what should university do to prepare the students, seeing what we're seeing now about the current you know, the issues faced by a lot of young learners and uh, the uncertainty brought in by the external environment, politically, environmentally, and uh, even socially. So this is really just the, the whole idea that got me think, I talk enough with my family and close friends, and I'd like to probably start sharing my thoughts. So this is really the first time ever I share my idea with people outside my network circle. So uh, I, I don't see it as in, you know, this is really just a dialogue I'm hoping to start. And uh, uh, for me, it's going to be a lifetime dialogue that I like to continue, informed by my experience as a faculty as well as my research. So probably I see the real journey just started. And maybe tonight marks that beginning point. So that is um, the title. You probably can see I'm skeptical about what universities are doing these days, although I am one of them teaching. Uh, so, I just want to focus on three things for tonight. First of all, really mapping out what are the current activities many universities do as a common thing. And then looking at this very trendy expression about higher education innovation. So, what does that innovation really mean and what is really happening? And then finally, I just want to bring to the importance of people. So, people matter can mean any matters about people, but also people matter, mm -hmm. as in people really important. So that is the, the three agendas I'm hoping to go through. So first of all, this is a really simple illustration I made. 
looking at how a learner learns and now what are the influences. So we have the very outer the institution, which is the educational system, the national uh, curriculum and the structure, the policy and so on. And then we have institutes like the universities in the higher education and the other schools. And then we have educators like myself, teaching faculties or, you know, teaching support to help students learn. And that at the center, that is the learners. So the reason I bring this up is not, a, not only because what I'm encountering now as an educator, when I was a learner, particularly at a young age uh, in China, the institution and the institute, i.e. the school where I attended and the university where I had my first degree, they shaped my learning behavior to a large extent, as in I was confined. I think that is the word I would like to use. I was confined by the rigidity of the national education system in China, as in don't think, just mm -hmm. memorize. Mm -hmm. And you do well in exam, you are brilliant. If you don't do well in exam, you don't have future. You don't go to university, what can we do about you? So those are the questions. And then that makes, we have a very famous expression in China. If you, everybody, like the young age, when they were in high school, ready to go to university, they are preparing to cross this narrow bridge, entering university. Seemingly, that is the only route to success. If you can't get in, your life is doomed. There seems to be nothing available for you to do to strive in your lifetime in China. And I was very much influenced by this idea. So this is how I shaped my early education experience. But then at the same time, I kept challenging why. So I was the kind of person I always asked the question, why do I have to do that? Why do I have to memorize Marxism? Why do I have to learn about political philosophy about China? Well, I'm more interested in literature and English. So a lot of questions actually came out from myself, but I don't get answers. I get told off. And that is how I was influenced at the very center of this circle. My teachers were just telling me what they were told by curriculum. And to the point, I actually said to myself quite clearly, there's no way I will be a teacher. <laughs> Having experienced what teachers were like, I said, there's no way I will become a teacher like that. So that is how any individuals can be influenced by the institution where they grow up and form their perceptions about what learning is about, what success is about. And then when we're looking at the type of university in the UK, which I happen to enter since the master degree. So I had the choice and I made the choice of coming to the UK to have further higher education. And that is when I started to learn more about the, my area, which is in human resource management. And that is my choice because I was interested in people and I'm feeling people are always necessary no matter where you work, what you do. And uh, I entered one of the, I think it's the plate class period. So this is actually, you know, thanks for preparing this talk. I actually dwell in a, bit, little, a little bit more about the type of universities we have in the UK. So currently there are 117, I think that added up to the whole uh, number of universities uh, available in the UK. But we have four main categories if we go by the periods they were set up. So obviously we had a very ancient universities established pre-18th century, uh, uh, 19th century, like the famous four in Scotland and plus the two in England. And then we have the red brick, which they use this kind of expression to, uh, it's, it's the kind of indicating of the type of buildings what they use during that time. So the very uh, representative red brick building is actually the Victoria building at University of Liverpool. So Liverpool was about that period between 1800 and 1960 set up. And that number is about uh, nine. So nine universities were set up by the local industries. This is also something I just learned is the local industry and business people 
created that nine universities aiming to encourage in people mobility and then also lessen the cl social classification. So those are actually the, uh, the periods that were set up. And then we have the plate class, which is 1960 to 1992. And during that time, we had this famous Robbins report in 1963, and hence the Robbins principle, which I have actually have information later. So that is when a further 24 universities were set up. Most of them were named after the city and the town they were in. So like the first one uh, among that period was University of Sussex was set up in 1961. And then again, the reason to call it place glass is because those kind of modern face, they have large glass panel as a window. <laughs> so that, again, to show this, those are the kind of buildings that universities tend to have in terms of constructions. And then the ancient university, obviously the, the traditional stone masonry work in contrast to the red brick. And majority of the universities we have in the UK are actually the post 92. So there's 78 of them across England, Scotland, and uh, Welsh. And these universities were actually, uh, many of them were converted from the college. I think one of the reasons followed by that further uh, Higher Education Act 1992, they want to remove the distinction between college and university degree. So they want to make, you know, make more colleges available to offer university level. So that actually means a lot of colleges who were delivering the kind of vocational based training, the hard learning, were given the right to offer degrees. And uh, they were all under the governance of the higher education quality assurance framework. That's what we call the UK QAA, the quality assurance uh, agency. So that governs the whole. So, but this is actually the diversity of the UK universities and uh, for me, coming from China, I actually took this acculturative learning and really a sharp transitioning from everything being told what should be like, a spoon-fed kind of teaching, to everything is you do it yourself, you explore yourself. So my first master at University of Leeds was not successful in my view compared to what I expect my students to achieve. Well, that's the time I literally came from pure foreign country and not having any information provided or supported. So everything has to be done by myself. And I was like exploring that. So yes, I didn't do it terribly good, but I did get the degree and then managed to stay on. And this kind of regret made me want to do more. So that is why I decided to do my second master, which is actually the, the MBA kind of master at Edinburgh here. And even when I was doing the MBA that time, I was talking to my classmates. I still remember talking to my classmates to say, I definitely don't want to be a teacher. <laughs> and uh, the next thing is, MBA is the final degree I'm having. I'm no more study. Just this, let me experience the, the freedom of university, then that's done. And then a year later, I started my PhD <laughs> at University of Edinburgh. So I, I'm just like, keep breaking my own words. And uh, now I realize, well, it's not because I don't like being a teacher. I just didn't want to be a teacher in China or the kind of teacher what Chinese schools are like. So I'm still interested in people. And that really brought me into the academia. So PhD was not the reason, uh, well, PhD was not the, uh, the, the kind of trigger towards a teaching position, but PhD was something I'm interested in and then to follow up. So this kind of dynamic actually bring in the, in, in my view, is the controversy. We have such a diverse university type. We have the very authentic, traditional academic institute, hundreds of centuries of old, but then we have the modern universities who focus more just like getting students graduate and that equip them with skills, but the skills are not lifelong skills, but skills that you can find a job and you can do that job. And the question really is, is that really under this kind of 
You know, is that really enough just to have a standardized curriculum? Well, every university fighting, knowing they're not available or they don't have the resource to really maintain the quality assurance and they're trying very hard and to the point that they become more instrumental than mm. challenging what is the, the, the real, what is the real role of education at the university. So that is why I brought in this, um, this chart really just to give a bit of illustration. <laughs> so the other part, looking at the current, the very common things university nowadays do, particularly in the UK, well, as the representation. So do excuse the red part. We tried to get rid of that line, but I couldn't because that needs the internet connection and showing the, the, the interactive map about the transnational. So one of the big terms many universities are talking about is the higher education internationalization. So that includes both having international students coming over to do a degree, to boost the income, and particularly for modern universities who receive less research funding or less, you know, the, the kind of relatively not so much the endowment from the government or the local government. They want that part of income maintained. And then the other trendy thing is knowing there's a capacity on campus in the country, they expand their education abroad and hence the transnational education. So that means they will do collaboration with universities in different countries, mostly in non-English speaking countries, in the developing economy such as Asia and Africa, and even uh, South America. And then they will bring the UK curriculum over, train the students, teach everything in English, but use the local staff to deliver that. And then pass the assessment centrally organized and designed by the UK university here and get a UK university degree. So that is the kind of TNE idea is you don't have to come abroad. You just do that at your home in your comfortable location surrounding. And this has been very prevalent. And over the last 10 years, I think around about decade, uh, the level of establishment of TNE in key Asian countries, even some in North American countries like Canada and even the States, um, they almost every university has some sort of transnational program going on. The larger ones like Napier, Coventry, and also um, universities uh, in London area, they all have different level of um, transnational program, even foreign campuses. And the student number, I show that graph. Yes, the graph will look busy, but you can see since 2006 up until 2022, the number surge, and the top one is China. Yes, Chinese students remain the largest population among the international. And now we have the later coming up. This line line is India. So we also have like currently, for example, the program I'm mostly teaching at my institute. 60% of the class are from India, 30 are from Nigeria, and then the remaining either from Pakistan or other parts of uh, Asian countries. So there is no home students, they just go mostly the international. And now we saw this, this darker line is Nigeria. So up until now, the number surge. And we might see a drop because of the regulation, visa regulation change, but it wouldn't drop that much. So that is really the change Which over was, Who is the one that sort of dropped off at the end? EU. EU. Oh, right. So that's why the Brexit yeah. coming here. Yeah. Yeah. And then the number mm -hmm. sharply yeah. dropped here. Yeah. Yeah. So I think reason is quite clear. <laughs> so what the, the reason I bring that is, well, you can see the increase in the student number, the international student number, and also um, the domicile of non UK and non-EU, what remains underdeveloped is the support at the institute level. So I still see reports from uh, organizations such as Universities UK, Scottish Higher Education, realizing how little institutes understand international students' learning needs and realize how little they know about their graduate career aspiration. Although they have been dealing with international students for over a decade, 
I mean, for students coming to the UK, that is even longer than a decade. Mm. So you can see, again, it's a sharp contrast between what they are getting and what is actually happening. So international students remain a mysterious crowd, and the more destinations they are from, the more confused institutes are. They don't know how to deal with it. And the place where I work is a very typical case. In the last five years, because of the pandemic, we had a sharp increase in international number. We kept looking at like a 300, 400% increase. That is how much that number has gone up. And uh, most of my colleagues are home uh, colleagues who have little overseas experience, who have not really dealt with such a large group and diverse group. And they carry on using the similar way how they would teach the home students to teach the international. But then they realize that is not the case and they start trying to find new things. But you can see, for even for universities who are accustomed to have international students all the time and introduce the TAE, they still do not pay sufficient attention to student development. So that is the question I come up with, exactly what are they, what are they doing to internationalize higher ed education? And actually, yes, a lot of people acknowledge that is marketization, is the income they are looking at. Mm -hmm. So university becomes a business. And uh, how easy to make money is always the better option. So TNE becomes more and more popular. And the other kind of debate is, are we colonizing these curriculum? So in many cases, uh, I'm involved in some of the TNE as well. I have noticed a lot of my colleagues they see themselves as a teacher of the teaching staff in the local countries because they don't speak English. They teach our curriculum. We should tell them what to do. And then we shape them. And that becomes, we are bringing UK curriculum to a local country like Nepal, like Vietnam. But should we do that? Are we saying that their education is not as good as us? Therefore, we need to help them. But how much, you know, it is it helpful to help them bring in what we think? You know, it's always about what we think they should have, not about what they should have to help them locally. So that question was never really seriously asked and probably overlooked because of the money side. And also, it, the idea, we, we call our transnational institutes as partners. When we talk about partners, we should have an equal weighting in this whole collaboration. But in reality, partners often is a receiver and a giver. And yes, there are countries, again, China is one of them, they are happy to receive because that means they don't have to do much. But there are other countries who generally want to have an equal collaboration, not just taking what is given by the UK institutes, but building the curriculum that is more suitable, but then, you know, embedding the strengths of both education. So that requires a deeper understanding of those host countries' education system in order to really make this transnational partnership, the partnership work. And equally, we can learn from them because many countries, they have their own values they follow. And some of them even go into the, the humanistic part like the countries where religions are dominating and philosophies are actually uh, embraced through that kind of uh, way of bringing people up. And that might be something we could benefit from it. So that is another kind of challenge. And especially I was one of the international students and I became the supporter and mentor of international students and now I'm teaching the international students. I see the journey they're going through when they're entering a foreign land and they get lost. But equally, they get lost for different reasons. And universities cannot really just ignore this part and really need to look at how to support the diverse student equity just among the international crowd. So now we're looking at another, the trendy word, as I said, the innovation. This is the quote I took 
from the Universities UK recent report on innovation of higher education. At the beginning, when they say how has innovation happened in higher education, they are saying more than ever, innovations in university teaching are supporting universities to prepare students for their future careers, equipping them with the skills and experience they will need to succeed. Sounds reasonable, yeah? But then, the celebration they are promoting is against the backdrop of the pandemic's innovations and culture shifts we have investigated how universities can rethink curriculum design and the ways teaching and assessment are provided. These changes could benefit graduate skills and employability if universities give themselves the freedom to invest in digital innovation. They have an opportunity to empower a better prepared graduate population. So it puts in, if you embed technology, you are doing innovation. And uh, some other writing in that report is looking at, in the past decades, how teachers have moved away from using traditional blackboard to the overhead projector to now using micro teams, and how students have moved away from writing exams to typing essays. So that is the success of the innovation in higher education. But is that really what innovation is about? So this is where I start looking at exactly what are the definitions of innovation. Yes, there are many. I got three provided in different periods. Peter Druk is the very leading scholar in entrepreneurship. And under this kind of context, his definition of innovation is about the importance of the entrepreneur creates new wealth producing resources or endows existing resources with enhanced potential for creating wealth. So entrepreneurs, if we put that in the higher education setting, those are probably the decision makers, the managerial and the higher education leaders. And they need to create the resources, not just re, you know, using technology to do the old thing. So it's almost like using some new thing to play the old trick. And where there is no new resources, and the endows existing resources with enhanced potential. So while we can argue innovation, the technology embeddedment is some sort of endows existing resources, but are they enhancing the potential for creating wealth? They are actually continue to support what universities have been doing over the past decades, preparing students for the labor market get them a successful job, hopefully lasting lifetime. But is that really what university is doing now, knowing changes happen all the time, every second, every minute? Are we preparing the old style workers for the new era? How many of us have worked one job from leaving the school until retire for the last 20 years? And how many more will do that? But why do universities still try to educate and prepare our students for that kind of so-called stable life? Well, there's no such thing as stability or certainty. So next definition is in 2009. Focusing on innovation is a multi-stage process whereby organizations transform ideas into new and improved products, surveys, or processes in order to advance, compete, and differentiate themselves successfully in their marketplace. So we can see university provides services like education. Then the process, meaning it's a layered process, are really leading to the kind of outcome that makes themselves standing out in the market, i.e. the higher education, higher education market. But embedding technology is such a prevalent thing now. Every university is using some sort of technology, the Blackboard, the, the Moodle to do your coursework. You know, you check your coursework online, you get your uploaded PPTs, you submit your essays via Turnitin, and then you use Microsoft Teams to have meetings, or some use Collaborate to have live classes. 
every university in the world probably, if they have an infrastructure on internet, are doing it. Because there were a period of time they had to do it during the lockdown. And now this carried on. So that is to maintain the old norm. Where is the differentiation? Where is the success? And how does that improve their market share as in most students coming to the university? <coughs> Not really. More needs to be done. And the final one, this one actually, in 2019, the definition looking at innovation involves some combination of problem opportunity identification, the introduction, adoption, or modification of new ideas germane to organizational needs, the promotion of these ideas, and the practical implementation of these ideas. So it's about ideas generating. It's about implementation to the outcome. Then technology embedding in teaching and learning. Where is the ideas? Is the old idea only coming out through a technology supported channel? So it is a means of delivering something, but the content remains probably untouched or ideally not touched at all. I have seen my colleagues who teach international business using 20 or 30 years old materials without touching them, without updating them, just teaching them to students year in, year out on international business. We all know what happened 20 or 30 years ago compared to what happened now. And then equally, we have colleagues who simply just bring in all kinds of theories from the textbooks, five or 10 years old, forming a very comprehensive teaching slice. In my view, it's just the description of all kinds of things and bombarding students, expect them to learn everything, not only about cross-culture management, but also about human resource management, as well as how to deal with performance, how to deal with reward, how to work in multinational corporations in a three-hour lecture and then expecting them to write a piece of 3,000 words essays covering a hypothetical discussion about what would happen if a company is expanding abroad, not evaluating what happens now, but you have to propose something new. And then you have to discuss the key things to international students. So that is the kind of reality of, in, of the classroom, and that is the mindset of many teaching faculty nowadays, when they prepare for the slides and prepare for the design, is all about what they think students should know or what they have learned or what they know, rather than asking the students what they want to know, what could help them and what is happening out there. So the disconnection between the classroom teaching and reality at many modern universities who once was college, not very strong in certain subject areas, particularly in business and management, it, it became a challenge for them. But at the same time, they are reluctant to break that stability. Well, ironically, we teach change management. Ironically, we're talking about change is the only constant. So that distortion between reality of learning and reality of teaching coexists and it does bring a sense of frustration. And many times I'm thinking, why do students learn this? What can they get out of that? And they, they pass the essay and they still don't know what's going on. And to the point that I asked some of my Nigerian students or MBA students, this is MBA, supposedly know, should know what's happening. At least I was, you know, the one we constantly talk about what happened during that time which happened to be the, the recent financial crisis. Mm -hmm. I asked them, do you know knowledge economy? Nope, never heard of it. And do you know what VOCA means? Nope, never heard of it. So those very common words are widely talked about in business domain, they don't know, and yet they are learning MBA. And they have experience of work in their own country but they don't associate. So this is where 
the link is not there, and the link should be provided by us as teaching faculty. But if we don't see that, how can we get that link? And how can we present students what they should know and how they can utilize the information they, they know happening out there uh, in the world? So the three definitions of innovation, none of them really supporting the idea that university higher education innovation is enough to apply technology. And the most ironic thing is this one. This is also, again, thanks for preparing for this, this opportunity made me realize we actually had Robin's principle proposed what university should look like in order to deliver the education that is to that level and maintain a balance of the system. So these are the four principles proposed in the Robbins Report in 1963, commissioned by the British government. And that was the kind of underlying principle that universities should be operating on. So instruction in skills. This is the part I have been, uh, I, I was thinking and reflecting, what do we mean by skills? Actually, they don't mean specialized subject area skills, rather the transferable skills, that the skills that enable individuals to learn enables us to acquire new knowledge without being taught, creating that initiative. So that's potentially feeding into the lifelong learning. So everybody is able to learn something as long as they acquire the necessary skills. But the next three, they all pointed out the importance of becoming, another trendy word, responsible individuals. We have the famous terms responsible leadership, corporate social responsibilities, responsible change, responsible marketing, or anything about ethics, business ethics, ethical leadership, ethical behaviors. So they all coming down to that. Very rarely it points out, oh, you need to have very specialized knowledge at university. Well, that is a given. We are providing that. But the goal is not everybody knows specialized area. It is how people can contribute to the society as a specialist, but at the same time as a responsible citizens to transmit a common culture and common standards of citizenship. And then the research is not there to bring publications stuck in the ivory tower. The research is there to support how teaching can be further enhanced. The content of teaching can be updated, can follow the trend or even lead the trend. But in reality, even among the research intensive institutes in this world, in the current world, not many of them or not many faculties focus their research on how they can enhance their teaching. Rather, they focus their research on how they can publish because they need that promotion. They need to become a professor and then they need to bring more money for themselves to support the research they are doing and then do more publications, become more famous, teaching, okay, when I have time. So this part is certainly lost in many ways. And the instruction in skills, yes, we're talking about that. We have graduation, a graduate employability. We have transferable skills training. We have academic skills training. And we even have reflective learning how to be a reflective learner, how to apply reflective approach to conduct learning development, the skills are still on the surface talking. And the reality is the outcome is not as good as it should be. Students still don't know how to do critical analysis. Students still don't know how to do reflection because teachers don't reflect. If they reflect, they wouldn't leave a 20 years old slides still on the teaching slides. And if they reflect, they will definitely need know how students can learn better and how to attract them and engage them. So the skills are in the talk, but skills are not fully taken into consideration. And about, about the cultivating men and women, it is the cognitive side of development, this is the part very much lost. When I do 
the teaching, one of the things I always make sure students know is how the approach can be applied to learn other subjects. And I often say this approach of writing your essay is similar to your write essay in other subject areas. And then the way you conduct your analysis and discussion is no different from you write an essay in economics, finance, or even supply chain. Doesn't matter the content, the process is similar. You just need to exercise that and understand and mapping out your idea. So at, this, at the same time, promoting authenticity, honesty. You know, I, I'm sure we all know the, the famous chat GPT, the scandals at universities. And we had to do a lot of things trying to stop that. One of the things is we check reference list because chat GPT creates fake references. We can easily do that. But then the very traditional trick a lot of international students have been doing is the ghost writing. It's a genuine writing, only not by themselves. And even the, you know, the detective device that turn in software can't check that out. But if you ask the question, ask the students to answer the question by speaking, you can easily tell, no, that is not what they wrote. But how many teachers are willing to make that effort, spend extra time just to pin down those kind of things? And then where is that cultivation of humans? Where is that transmitting culture towards a more responsible citizenship? Where is that ethics? So while well, we're talking about that, but in reality, many reasons seem to outnumber the need to do something. And that is why many students just get away and other students just feel unfair if they knew. And actually they all know who is doing the ghostwriting. They just don't tell us. But now we start to know, and that is up to how we're going to deal with it. Everybody has their own way of dealing with it. So the reality of university is not as grand as what it looks like from outsiders' point of view. When we enter it, a lot of things should be done very differently for a better result. But for one way or the other, they're not doing it. And this is where leading to my big question. What should university do? Do we lead the trend of social development or do we just conform to what is happening? As in whatever is happening, we accept and then we either shape it in a more systematic way or we're trying to cover it in a more grand way. And do we, you know, how much do we accept or embrace provocative approach to challenge what is happening nowadays that are not very healthy, not very responsible, and bearing a lot of underlying concerns. So what should university do? They lead the advancement, or do they withdraw from the advancement? And actually, that is where, coincidentally, the book my husband bought me arrived today. It is uh, actually called The New Long Life. The authors of The Hundred Years Life wrote this book to further discuss when we have a longer life expectancy, what kind of learning we should embark on to abandon the traditional three stages. So one of the things she's saying, education is competing with technology advancement, but should education compete with the technology advancement or should education lead the technology advancement? And one of the things she said, in order to embrace the technology, we actually need more than ever the human skills. Mm. So some of the, one of the quotes I really like is from the industry. No, it's not from the educator. It's actually the former vice president of retail at Apple. She actually said, the more technologically advanced our society becomes, the more we need to go back to the basic fundamentals of human connection. Because one of the things is, the cognitive ability creates these new ideas. That is where the technology idea comes from. We only see the end product. We don't see how and where that came from. And then that is where we challenge the STEM, the scientific education. Our pre uh, prime minister seems to be very up for that, promoting STEM education. But STEM is only to do the end product. 
Where does that idea come from? If people all just train in a scientific way, they will become less and less creative. And the ideas of the creative ideas, the new inventions, the new technology uh, upgrade will not come from. So that is actually um, over the time is making the technology go go dead, and then actually making people more and more rely on technology. You know, like I was jokingly with Alex saying. Are we training our younger generation to be towards a robot? Are we competing who can do better job as operating and programming? Not really. We are not here to train robots. We are here to train human minds who can manage and control what is happening and even lead out the way. And uh, one of the things she actually regard, started to say, they are institutes start to introduce the STEAM education. So adding an A as in art into the step, keeping the humanistic touch rather than purely go for the technology side of things. So, but all in all, it brings to the fore the importance of human input and human contribution. And that is where the education sector should be focusing on. We are training people, we are not training robots or we are not training people who operate robots in future. The AI is something that we can use but not be led by the whole technology that the artificial intelligence talk. So, so that is why do we challenge the reality? Do we question what is it, you know, is that right? Is that appropriate? What more should we do? Or do we just say, okay, AI is here, we need to embrace it. Let's, let's see how we can embrace it. So that is why the Russell Group, the university actually come up with a code of conduct of how to appropriately using AI for the study. Well, yes, it has some merit, like you can't cheat, use the chat GPT, but revising using the AI, where is that information from on the AI? Is the database fed by netizens? How many netizens are qualified to explain the theory properly? We have done real tests asking the AI to write an essay on the topic. It was atrocious. <laughs> Theories do not make sense. Explanation do not make sense. Everything about reference is faked. So that is the reality of AI. And if students are, you know, students are allowed to use the AI to aid their study. How can they know whether AI is giving them the suitable guidance? Who is actually creating those information? We don't know. Who is working at the background? No one knows. But we are using it. And this is where, you know, we, we once challenged Wikipedia being too subjective. And then now Wikipedia has to bring references out. You can't just input anything without a reference. And it's the same thing with AI. Where is that reference? Where is that fundamental theory support and content support? No one knows. As long as it's free access, it seems popular enough. But are we learning or are we just feeding into this hallucination? <laughs> That's the term I like. So at the same time, while people think AI is helping, actually, we are seeing more and more students suffering. The mental health issue is ever so important. And I realized, you know, well, AI technology is supposed to make our life easier and probably, you know, handle some of the issues, including study. But reality, again, doesn't tell us the same story. There is a distortion. So this is probably quite recent statistics uh, a survey commissioned uh, by the, actually the, the report was on the House of Commons library. And the key statistics, the interesting part is the most common causes of stress. So universities are trying their best to help students to learn and yet students feeling stressed of that. So the question really, why are they stressed? I don't think it's because students don't want to learn. I think there's something missing between what they want and what is available there. 
and also how the teaching is conducted and organized at university. We don't know. And uh, yes, we do a lot of surveys among students, over surveys, <laughs> but we never really find out how students learn. We only talk about are they happy about the course? Are they happy about their prospects after the study? But those are just views. There is no evidence to really support that. But that common causes of stress, well, you know, we do question self-reported survey sometimes, not always, uh, you know, capturing the, the real picture. But this is a good representative of the sample. Looking at the first three, they are all about learning related. So from that perspective, it is really the time that we as educators question, are we doing anything right? If right, why students are stressed? And one of the interesting statistics in that uh, study actually is 30% of students reporting that their stress got their stress issue got worse since they started university. And that actually is quite alarming. Like university, rather than making them feel they have the freedom and they have the flexibility to explore themselves, really, you know, offering them ambitious environment, they feel more and more stressed. So the reason for that, again, yet to be find, uh, found out and quite important. So, so far we can see really, I'm pulling information from different aspects, but all putting, uh, pointing to the key thing, as I said, so far, I have not seen anything that can stimulate our intellectual development according to what universities are doing. It's more about streamlining, as in everybody is doing that, I'm doing the same. And without questioning, without really asking and reflecting, is that suitable for us? Are we in the position to offer different courses or are we in the position to host diverse students or are we in the position to really sustain this kind of, of variety of the education within the country and outside the country? So do we have enough capable educators to provide that kind of teaching and learning? And those questions are not really answered. And I don't know any, if anybody would willing, willingly answer that question or if anybody really know the answer of that. So, <clears throat> so I bring this back again, but the title is People Matter. So I highlighted the last two. Education is to educate individuals. Individuals who are a member of the society, the community, to prepare them, to facilitate them, educators carry a very important role. So both are people. And if you're looking at the, you know, the relationship, educators have direct contact with learners. Whether the education system, you know, despite of what system, the policy, the teaching and learning practices, you can shout as loud as you want to say they are good, they are innovative, they are really cutting edge. After all, it's down to educators to make that happen. If they are not ready to embrace the new things, they are not ready to really change their mind, learn, and really listen to the learning needs of the students. All those instrumental level, all the, the institutional level changes, policies, even the technology uh, enhancement will become pointless because educators will not do it. This is where that can be the resistance. So anything can happen at the broad level, but at the micro level where students can truly benefit from anything new, potentially helpful, is through us, the teaching faculty. So if we are not prepared, we do not adjust ourselves in how we support our students' learning, nothing will have a very fruitful future. So that is why 
Well, we talk about all these kind of things. Probably the very fundamental issue we need to start looking at is how to prepare ourselves as teaching faculty, and how to put our mind or adjust our mind towards facilitating students' learning rather than teaching them, telling them. So that is the people matter part, and also talking about the people matter. So for me. The questions remain to be answered or continuously to be explored is what is university? Who are its stakeholders? The stakeholder bears a strong indication of they need to be involved and then they are part of the whole education. So that really makes a lot of people, a lot of uh, groups, stakeholders. And more importantly is how do we make the multiple stakeholders understand the importance of adjusting higher education and to make them work together to support the real cultivation of responsible citizens of the future. So I see myself embarking on this kind of journey, supporting individual development through restoring intellectual stimulation rather than continual feeding the intellectual streamlining. And to really wrap up with my idea, I bring this quote by Goethe, Treat people as if they were what they ought to be and you help them to become what they are capable of being. So I'm endeavored to become that you, to help people equip or to facilitate them to equip the right skills, right knowledge, right mindset, so they can learn anything they want, not through me, but through themselves continuously within the classroom or outside the classroom. So that is my goal as the educator and that is pretty much what I'm started doing and hopefully I can attract more like-minded people to join this dialogue and then bit by bit make a difference. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question? Because yep. I was interested you went back to the Robbins principles yes. in 1963. Yep. Because I think there was one thing you were missing in all that. Mm -hmm. I have a long memory. I first went to university in 1968, uh -huh. a long time ago. Yeah. And when I went to university in 1968, it was the top 5% of school students who went to university. And universities were very definitely institutes of learning, and you went there to be a learner. Mm. In about the 1980s, 1990s, there was a political agenda which said universities are elitist. Only 5% of people are going there. That's terrible. It should be 50% at least. Yeah. And universities responded to that by expanding. But by expanding, they became businesses. It became commercial. And students were no longer learners, they were customers. Yep. And the universities were producing product, yep. which was the students. And it's that philosophical change which yes. left behind the Robbins principles and became a commercial institution instead, which has resulted in many of the things that you're talking about, with which I totally agree, I have to absolutely, say. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So this is actually, you know, if we're looking at the, this three points, yes. we can... I don't think any university can comfortably or confidently stand up to say, no, we are doing that. I can't see the evidence. Even the Asian university, you know, the Edinburgh, uh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, they say they are still doing this tradition and they're trying to follow that. But the recent scandals, the recent movement, what they are embracing has nothing to do with cultivating, rather that is pampering. Yes. That is probably the word I use. They make... They don't want to make students feel bad. It is about the feelings. It's about how to make you happy. But everybody has their own way to be happy. And then lose the whole um, educating point. And we took a point, I think I did, some examples I can, I can give you is, I have colleagues who are very caring. So we had, uh, you know, whenever there's a bus strike, there's a train strike, our colleagues are willing to cancel the class in case students couldn't make it. But to me, my view will be, make every effort come to your class. 
Mm. You are student. Mm. We have to go. I don't see why you can't. But come to them is, oh, you know, we need to have contingency plans. We can't really deliver the class because I don't think students will come. And also, I have a colleague who even openly told us, oh, next week is a coursework submission week. So I don't think many of our students will come to the class. So as a result, I will change my lecture to recorded lecture. So they don't have to come. <laughs> She's allowing them to be absent. She's giving them the reason to be absent. And uh, in that mindset, of course, students will feel, oh, I'm okay. You know, it's okay for me not to come to class because, you know, even a teacher allows that. And it's okay. I don't submit my essay in time as long as I say, oh, uh, my bus is canceled. Oh, my, my, you know, the, the, the storm actually just kept me in. Well, yeah, that is life. You know, when we grow up, we deal with all kinds of life. And I don't think any company will accept their employees' excuse to say, I can't come in because the train is canceled. Or you make a bus. Yeah, but on, at the same time, I also acknowledge, yes, they might be genuine problems. So if I were the higher education leadership kind of thing, I would say, okay, this is what's happening. The bus is going to be canceled due to strike. So can we organize some bus to pick up our students? Or can we support our students financially to say, if you come via a taxi or arranged kind of other transport, we will reimburse you, but we want you to come. If that is the kind of attitudes from the higher education institutes, students will feel, yes, it is their obligation to come to that class to learn, rather than finding excuse not to make that effort, not to fulfill a duty as a student. So, yes, Robin's principle is lost in my way, in my view. Yeah. Even the older universities who claim to, you know, follow that is much lost. And yet I have seen a report done in 2013 by the Scottish Higher Education, they are trying to say they follow the Robbins principle on um, promoting the higher education in Scotland, which I'm afraid I don't see that. <laughs> 10 years ago was not the case, 10 years later, definitely not the case. So this is where really a um, lot of things that challenge us to really look back. So in the past, how university started and uh, what university was really about needs to be restored and the standard curriculum needs to stop. We can't have one size fit all. We teach our students, there's no such thing as one size fit all. And yet they have one standards curriculum to uh, assess every university's performance. How can a college converted university have research portfolio? Well, half of their staff don't even have a PhD which is actually a very common thing among modern universities. They allow teaching staff without a PhD to but be a full-time class. The prestigious universities had very few PhDs on their staff. They honestly did, very few. While they didn't have the PhD, their teaching was very much they you know, on the research related. This is why I still, I, I think, I mean, I graduated from university in 1963, so I'm really old. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, obviously when I, graduated from university, it was the 5%. And I was very well prepared by my high school education to go to university and to take advantage of it. But the things that were done with us as teenagers, as high school students, were to um, train us to certain ways of questioning things, of, of going, and, and those techniques anyone could use, and they were largely used in apprenticeships as well, where you weren't just given something, you were told, all right, you go away, take these things and see if you can do this with them. You know, and so you had to puzzle it out for yourself, which was largely what my high school was about. Yeah. And, and of course, talk to write essays and do things like that. Yeah. Um, and then when you went to university, those, that kind of learning, and training was continued. So when you had to sit down in front of the professor and write your final exams by hand or laterally, we could type, there were no computers then, um, you, you knew that you were just in the room, you weren't allowed to bring anything in and, and yet you felt, I can do this, I can show what I've learned. 
instead of the idea that somebody from somewhere is going to write it for you. And your classes involved you with your colleagues having to talk and having to argue in front of the teacher who then could tell whether you'd actually read what you were meant to have read, whether you, you could handle this type of material. And that was true for sciences as well as humanities. So we, th we have the techniques. We could make them even better because we could present them much more attractively and more sophisticated on computers and, and stuff. But that isn't what educators are doing. Well, I mean, one of the skills that employers are now really prefer is people are resourceful. Yes. So by being resourceful mm -hmm. is they are able to search for the suitable information helping them mm -hmm. solve problem. But the level of the, this kind of prevalence of the student's care has removed this being mm -hmm. resourceful. As I think the examples, mm -hmm. I mean, like, yes, it sounds quite ironic. I have students on their final year coming to me as their personal tutor saying she is uh, suffering from some anxiety because of the coursework load, the dissertation, everything. So I asked her, did you speak to the student counseling service? Or oh, I'm not aware of such service. It's been there, it's always there, and yet they don't even go out to explore. So they, you know, it, it becomes a kind of culture, they're just waiting to be told. Hmm. And I don't think employers will accept that. Employers will, you know, they always say, I want people who can take initiative. That everybody is saying, but yet the university is not preparing that. And yet they claim they want to prepare their students for a successful career. So, you know, a lot of nice talks, but in reality, it does not happen. And uh, I, I feel sorry for students who do not receive the right level of facilitation. So I'm not saying, yes, students should take the responsibility to, to do their own learning. But at the same time, educators are also responsible to guide them. We are the job. We have the job to facilitate, to, to show them what could be done differently. And then they go out test. We're not here to teach them chapter by chapter what they are. Because I always tell them, you can read. I can read. You don't need me to tell you. Go read and tell me what you think. And if you want my feedback, you need to do it. I mm. feedback to the work. If you don't give me anything, how can I feedback? Mm -hmm. Then how can you learn if you don't have any feedback? So that kind of vicious circle, it just carry on. So this is actually one of the things uh, is, is the mindset, very importantly. And yes, students can be cultivated because they are younger generation, they have that capacity, yeah. but they need to be guided properly, in my view. I mean, I think, you know, when you talk about the 5% and the 50%, um, I think that probably, maybe not 50%, but certainly a much larger percent of people could benefit from exactly the education I had and could have just done as much with it as I've done with it. It was, you know, it was that they just never got access. They never, you know, there weren't the places. And so there was just competition and, and they weren't being prepared because they knew there weren't the places. But we could do a lot better yeah. for the, you know, that whatever percent of people really, you know, are A, able and B, want to have this kind of, uh, life thought and, you know, skill learning and development and so on. I mean, there's, not everybody's the same. But people have more potential than we're given credit for. So, something I've long craved for, and I, in, interestingly, I'm now in higher education for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've long craved uh, just as an individual, it sits for the, the, the idea of being able to sit an exam. Because I've been, I've self, uh, I've, 
self learn but I've learned yes. I learn in my life. Yeah. Like and then so I can think throughout my life. Like uh, so of, of uh, somebody who's who's in hospitality, you know, a bartender mm -hmm. who, who puts I know just you know a huge amount of study into philosophy. Yes. Um and, and is very knowledgeable about these things. And I think a lot of people exercise these research skills, these uh, uh, um, these production skills. Yeah. Um, but what 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 are the administrative structures there? So a part of uh, education I've, I've understood as is is it's in being being in dialogue mm. and being able to put. Put your ideas in front of other people and go, <clears throat> what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. And I've uh, foraged in the world to do that, to find other people and go, well, I, I, you know, I was thinking about this in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then I've, I've been privileged enough to have people to nurture me. Um, but that idea of when you've developed a, something that you want to contribute to into the world, yes. into culture, yes. what are the opportunities there to have that value? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wonder, wondering whether those those opportunities, in, in th think about uh, Martha Nussbaum's mm. uh, capabilities mm. framework. Um, so, just just to contextualize that, you know, I I produced a, a thesis uh, on on the treatment of atopic conditions, mm -hmm. and the, the the local chamber of commerce said, "Oh well, this is great. Why don't we talk? You know, we'll, we'll see if we can make you know uh, make this into." Uh, something that's operational in society, and then just found out that there's pretty much no space for that. So I, it feels like dead stock. Mm -hmm. uh, and turning to the academics centres, uh, it's all well. You're not qualified. You you, you can only have that conversation once you're qualified. So I'm wondering how much these structures are containing innovation, are yes. containing uh, invention. Yes. Um, but the, the, just the natural propensities of human beings, everybody would argue, yeah. we, 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 it, it's how we thrive. It's, it's a part of our sociological habitat. I, I think what we really need to ask is why do they set up structures like that? Because mm. I think the why question usually brings out a different intention, might not be genuine to support it. I mean, one of the things I really feel strong, like my daughter is doing the advanced hire or the hire, and then she was writing an essay. And when I was helping her, she, she kept telling me, well, this is not how we are supposed to write. We have a certain structure. Mm -hmm. And I said, the structure doesn't matter. It's the content. It's this guy, oh, we can't do that. We'll lose mark on that. <laughs> so you produce the analysis, but then you have to have a form. You have a formality, so you lose that formality, but it might give you flexibility, and yet you can't do that. But at university, there's no such thing as a formality, the structure, then how high school students can prepare themselves to write freely when they are so used to, I need to have that structure to do that. So I, I do see some, some sense of that, but teachers have not been explaining properly. I think this is all about trying to, to form a sense of thinking and analysis, but they need to tell them why we're following that structure rather than follow the structure or you lose mark. Mm. So that kind of dialogue is missing and uh, it creates another hurdle. So even for home students, when you know you are so used to the education and yet you enter a brand new world at your university. Yeah, you realize well, this is not what I learned. That's not how we learned. What do we do? And the first year is still transitioning. I was really not fully utilized. So, so the whole education system, higher education is only one snapshot. It's the whole system that needs yes. challenging. 
And the preparation needs to start as early as possible because that is the mindset development, is the cognitive development, growing up. And uh, who knows, that might just help with the mental health issue. Because when people are more and more able to sit out what's happening to themselves, they will feel less and less stressed and then focus more and more on how to intervene rather than, what do I do? And uh, I'm stressed, you have to help me. You're supposed to help me. No one's supposed to. <laughs> but you're right, but yeah, it's not just higher education. Mm -hmm. but certainly schools have become places that produce a product too. And yeah. They have measured on the success of the number of A-levels that students yes. get. Yes. Yes. There's this big row going on at the moment about Ofsted and it's the way in which it actually assesses schools right. and assesses how good they are. But it's the same problem at the end of the day. That that your know, schools are seen as being somewhere that you are a customer paying them yeah. to produce a product, which is your child who gets so many A levels, who yeah. then goes to university, becomes part of another product system that's going to produce a degree, yeah. a master's degree, maybe a PhD at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. And the whole purpose of education is lost in that. I mean, yeah. I always remember that education is about teaching people how to think, not what to think. Exactly. That it's about teaching people how to look, but not necessarily what to see. Yeah. But yeah. that's lost because Absolutely. the idea is it has to conform to this product outcome. Yeah. And yeah. you talked about China. I'm fairly familiar with China because my wife's Chinese. Oh. <laughs> uh, and so I know a lot about the Chinese education system. And I know a lot about Chinese students when they come here because I've actually helped several of them sort of cross that transition, if you like. Yeah. But it's the same sort of thing, you know, that, that again, it's a different product. It's a political product in China. Yeah. But here, the product is a commercial business product. But it's yeah. the same problem with the system. Yeah. You're gearing everything to produce that desired product, yeah. ignoring everything else. Yeah, so that they lose the, really the whole fundamental consideration. You know, you have that product. So what? What next? Mm. They, don't, they don't seem to really ask that question. And... Uh, you know, students who have limited life experience certainly wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, come up with that kind of question themselves. But if people do not ask, mm -hmm. they will just continue doing things, benchmarking what others do. Mm -hmm. And then they feed back to their younger generation, okay, this is what you do. You go to university, you get a degree, then everything should be okay. Mm -hmm. This is how I came, up, came around. So, you know, so we are not looking at the, the product, the end product, this end product reproduce. We are humans. We will have our offsprings and they will have their offsprings. So we pass on our experience. And if that experience is not really in, you know, stimulated, then the next generation will carry on. And one of the things I tell my students, how can I teach you? If I teach you, you will not learn 100% of what I have learned. You will always have a bit of, you know, you might learn maximum 90% of what I know. And then you go away with 90% of my knowledge mm -hmm. and then you pass it on. So that is a decrease. But the idea is you should be able to create more knowledge than what I know. You should know more than me. That is the education. So I'm an educator. I'm not here to control my product, to say, this is what I know. I teach you, you should not be better than me. No, you should be better than me. If not, then I'm doing something wrong. And then by knowing how, like how we think, that is over a century ago, John Dewey was talking about how we think. It's the reflect the three level of thinking. That idea carry on now. So where is that innovation? We can't even utilize the past intellectual properties properly. What innovation? So nothing is new. It's only how we utilize or we reintroduce what has been accumulated over thousands of years, mm -hmm. you know, those ideas. And everything is all fundamentally about philosophy. And when was philosophy, the whole idea started, even before Christ. Because people uh, had questions. Yeah, so, yeah, we have questions. So, you know, this is how uh, it becomes a product. It's easy to make product mm. than to make a model or to make, uh, you know, really the thinking machine to produce something. Yeah, so that is what I have. Uh, the one thing I feel very conscious of some of my incompetent colleagues who kept telling me, well, this is the first time I'm running this course, so it is always challenging. We are learning. I'm thinking you're learning at the cost of my students. 
because students will not know whether or not you are giving enough information. They will just learn whatever they are told. And then you're telling me you are learning by teaching. So this year students will be wasting their time then. So their time is sacrificed for the next year because next year should be better. But what about this year? So, so this is actually the really scary talk and they think it's absolutely fine to say, I'm learning, it's challenging for the first time running. No, it shouldn't be. We are educators. We are liable for a person's life, future. And you are telling me to use them as a trial. Is that a product? So again, it's a product. Well, I'm not quite skeptical, Julian. Meaning somebody yes. who engages in teaching. Yeah. But uh, I'm aware that actually the process of teaching is also a learning process for me because I have to revise my own knowledge, for example. Yes. Yeah. I have to add to my knowledge. I have to look at recent developments. And all that is actually teaching me as well as me then teaching the people that I'm actually learning. Well, the learning carries on, yeah. So, because like, this actually differentiates. I learn mm -hmm. all the time, even I, when I'm preparing my teaching. But the learning is before I teach, you know, in your preparation period. I make sure that I exhaust all I can find to prepare and then better deliver that teaching. Not when I do the teaching. I mean, I, I take what you're saying. Yeah. I can understand that, it's particularly at certain levels of teaching. But at some of the teaching levels that I'm engaged in, it's much more interactive than that. Yeah. That it's actually about sharing knowledge and experience and me learning something from the students yeah, yeah. that yes. enables me to look at the things yeah. with a, a wider perspective mm -hmm. and challenging them to do the same. Yeah, um, you know, that to, is... To expand it. their perspective yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. So I don't go into teaching saying, I know everything I'm going to tell you what, what it's like. Exactly. Often yeah. I'm going and saying, this is a picture. Yeah. What do you think of this picture? Let's yeah. discuss it. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite often, I, I enjoy the most is I have a framework. I know this is the center of my topic. And then I go in, depending on the audience, I change my way. I can even do that half day. If I realize what I planned didn't work, okay, in the afternoon, I change completely and then uh, take what the learners feedback. And also the, the framework, like what I like is I have a plan, but I can change my plan at any time. But many universities, they have this plan fixed. You have that plan, you can't change because you have to follow that. And then it becomes like everybody can use that curriculum, just, just reproduce, but without really knowing why it was designed that way. And uh, it's not taking the ownership. It's also, it's, this is really just like a example in that. Okay, I get the set of materials. I just follow that teaching. I read out. You know, this is my preparation. Rather than engaging intellectually, well, we keep telling students, engage in your learning, engage in your reading. But are we engaging enough in teaching? So this is quite, you know, like what, how you uh, engage with your students. This is something that I do and that I totally agree with. But that kind of competence does not come from how much, how many books we read. It's how we handle the knowledge. And to the point that, I can't teach something brand new because I can learn from the learners. And then from that feedback, I process that information and reproduce and then guide them through that. And that requires the cognitive ability. And this is the part many of the teaching faculties across many universities, they do not pay enough attention to. Them. They think teaching is you have a fully designed slice you do very standard case study discussion and that is done. That is interaction. And then this is the textbook everybody using and accrediting body allows that. What do you complain? I have the full material for you. That is six hours worth, but I'm supposed to do that in three hours. No. So, so that is actually the part. And they, it, then it becomes a streamline. You should do it for the sake of work teaching. Work problems, I think, is that um, designing curriculum and designing even a lesson plan for your two hours or your hour or whatever it is you're doing is not a skill that is formally taught to an awful lot of people who are teaching at university level. They've done an MBA. That, that's the qualification. But they haven't actually been taught how to identify what they want the learning outcomes to be, 
and how they're going to structure activities or reading or whatever that will um, give learners a fair shot of getting to those outcomes and how they're going to assess whether the outcomes have been met or not. And I think that a lot of the not so good teaching that one sees falls down that way. They think, I know something and I just need to tell everybody about it. And that, of course, isn't, um, that isn't teaching. It's sharing, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. in a way. Um, and I suppose some people with exceptional intelligence and thirst to know things will actually manage to learn something from it, but a lot of people won't because they don't, as you say, they don't engage. They, they think of it as just, this is a chunk of something and I'll be able to remember enough of it if there's an exam. I mean, probably the younger crowd, I you know, you must have either experience in the university or just finished. No, I'm also interested because this is, you know, I'm looking at from the educator perspective and you probably from the student perspective. So I'm just wondering any of the observational experience you had that really... Well, I'm, I'm in university. I'm currently in second year. Uh, and it's, I mean, yeah, very much what it means that I can find it quite easy to disengage, but just do what I have to. <clears throat> it's just do what I have to do and not anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially this year, but in previous years, I think it was a bit different. Um, because it is quite kind of, you just have the things you have to do, and that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not in the other yet. Uh, I just finished high school in Germany. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the idea. Um, but to be honest, I'm like quite scared, actually, of starting university. Because I'm like witnessing some of my friends starting university. And just their experience is pretty much negative right now, just even though they just started out, it's just they're exhausted already and they're not really engaging in the classes um, because they are given the opportunity not to engage. That's what it's yeah. 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 Then they have the chance to stay at home and like do it online or read the textbook and then write an essay about it. So if they don't have to be that, they won't be that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I'm afraid of. They're falling into as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I don't know, maybe it's also just Germany, <laughs> maybe it's German universities that also like actually like support that even more, like this disengaging from actual like, classes. Because we are building a lot of like online classes right now. Yeah. That's not really yeah. awesome. Yeah. Just like also letting people stay at home just because they have to like take the bus for an hour or something. And that's something where I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? Like, I would have to take the bus for an hour just to come into the city, so yes. I don't know. But yeah, it's definitely like, I don't know, for me, a bit scary thinking about some university right now. Just because I think I am very interested in them, and I am very interested in like, engaging in discussions as well. And I don't see that happening in the university right now, and I think I to be This is actually the scary part, when the dynamic is like that. Over the time, you could be just influenced without even noticing that, although you had a lot of different intentions. And uh, this is really the moment that testing how strong-minded you are to seek different opportunity to continue this kind of engagement intellectually rather than being you know, dragged into one of them or feeling you should be one of them. This kind of conforming is always scary. You know, how to be different mm. and maintain what you really want to be. And I think like German University probably not much different from the UK here. And uh, yeah, not really <laughs> different. And uh, it's, it's not about the curriculum. It's about the people you're engaging. And then also what the professors and teachers are really supporting that. And I think the other thing is, well, we always talk about attendance. You, know, you have to be in the class. But I tell my students, if you're not here to learn, you don't even listen, why bother sitting here? You might as well just go out. I rather people sitting here and really listen to me and engage and have a conversation. And if that is the case, then um, there are times, you know, even I had the time, I don't go to class, I can learn myself. But that is providing I have a circle, I could exercise my, you know, mind and really uh, communicate and continue to learn. So I find my own comfort circle if the, the class doesn't provide me that. So 
learning in classroom is not necessarily positively associated with your performance. It's how you learn. If you want to learn, you can learn in any way, and you can learn from anybody. But it's much more fun to learn with other people、It、who、is. are equally curious. Yeah, who have very maybe opposed views to you that you can argue with them. You know, it is will force you to into reading things you didn't particularly think you wanted to read.、Um, and of course, it does differ from field to field. I mean, it's rather different if you're、um, doing history than if you're doing,、um, you know, quantum physics. I think, but they all require that intellectual curiosity and. And a desire to kind of keep pushing further. I was interested in the fact that you mentioned student mental health、mm. because King's College London published a study in September who、mm. said that student mental health issues have tripled、yes. recently, and that one in six students was actually suffering from some kind of、yeah. mental health issue.、Yeah. Uh, in fact, I used that in the blog that I do occasionally. <laughs> so, It's just that it's quite relevant to what you were saying because the, the mental health issues are actually quite serious. It is, and the need for appropriate support for students during their training, teaching period, learning period is、yeah. really becoming more and more an issue that needs address. Yeah, and Maybe, that actually extends to the high school. Yes, that's right. You know,、yeah. the high school students they also suffer from some、yes. mental health issue, but they're not, you know, they're not conscious of that. Yeah, I、um, think I think. The, Being in, in an environment where you're expected to do certain things and you don't feel like you are capable of doing them, if you haven't really been taught how to do them well, must be extremely stressful.、Um, and I think that most of the mental health problems that I remember from fellow students when I was at university was not that they felt they couldn't do the work.、Mm. But they felt that if they didn't get super marks,、mm-hmm. their father was going to be furious. <laughs> you know, it was it was sort of like、yeah. silly outside pressure, not the sense that they themselves would were completely not capable. But now I think you do have people feeling like, "What am I doing here? This is awful!" And I just I'm just completely lost. I'm very curious about、uh, whether there's been a contraction of the life of learning outside of the formal spaces. So thinking about, like, I've been told really lovely stories, but by, by somebody who, who studied at Cambridge,、mm. uh, it was really emphasised part of of the learning was. Outside of the classroom, were, were both small rooms where you were in proximity, and it was conversational. It wasn't really set out plans, but there were things like halls, so people would eat together.、Mm-hmm. And at a certain point of the dinner, you change places, so you、mm-hmm. speak with other people,、mm-hmm. and it was、uh, it's unashamedly. Everybody's interested in everything and debating everything.、Yes. Uh, I, I'm sort of curious whether that contracted because my experience of being at the University of Iowa is that the social interactions, or even if the teaching is happening in spite of the administrative structures、mm-hmm. and the technologies, like it, it is a labyrinth. To do things, even like, even trying to print something out in the library,、mm-hmm. <laughs> as it, it's it's a surreal sort of Monty Python <laughs> Kafka sketch, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or or book book a room that's empty, and、uh, can, can I use that room so we can just meet and talk? Oh、uh, well, you know, we'll have to get the computer to do this, but it's a bit, but. The the administrative structures, which are the, are now governed by these opaque softwares, yes, are are 
are almost entirely dysfunctional. Yes. And, and so both teachers and students' energies are taken up by trying to negotiate these yeah. labyrinths. Mm -hmm. And then people are just exhausted. And another thing, I, I'm sort of, I've been surprised at how terrified students are of each other. Mm -hmm. like, I really want to read other people's work because I've got a genuine interest. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking from when I've heard them speak, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's really interesting at that angle. But there, there's, everybody sort of seems, it feels very compressed compartmentalized and I don't know where, what it is, whether it's it's just this university structure has been designed in sort of a computer-aided design world <laughs> and then people have been fed into this system. Uh, so yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, because like I, I once had some kind of idea, if I were to organize say a program, I can, you know, that can be easily packaged into a kind of a large project and students become the team member. So from day one, they enter the university, they work towards this project as their graduate one. Mm -hmm. And then along that journey, they search out what information they need to know to help them prepare and then plan out each stage. And the faculty will become facilitator to guide them to say, you know, anything you missed or how you can do it better. So give them sufficient time to explore. And that means you will be working with different people. You will have the conversation that always relevant to the project completion and engaging learning and take your initiative to search for information yourself. So it's almost like this is, you know, university now talking about student led teaching. Mm -hmm. One of the things they do is asking students, volunteers to get together, design a curriculum mm -hmm. without any training, just ask them to do it and then trying to see how that worked. And I don't think this went very far because this kind of conversation died fairly fast a few years ago. But now we still talk about student-centered. I agree, student-centered should be, you suggest any suitable readings based on the topic you are supposed to know. And then you come to recommend that to me. And then you tell me why this is good. And then we can have that discussion. Because that is how, you know, like you, this is how you will learn better, you have that that is the intellectual stimulation. You, you learn from each other. And that is probably the, the period I enjoy the best is my first year in PhD. We have conversation over the drinks, over the dinner, in the corridor, in the cafe, anywhere, we just talk. And uh, not until we talk, you know, many, a group of us like just like want to share our idea, we do something similar in research. And then we just share ideas and then we get, we get ideas out of that talk. And the talking was like nonstop. Mm. And it just become, we just want to talk. Mm. And that is the part that really shaped a lot of mindset of me understanding the, the, you know, the research context I was going into and something new, you know, which is about third sector organizations. And uh, this is something that should happen from undergraduate because you're going to do a dissertation then, you know, everything is preparing you to carry out that independent project. But the large project should be enough to host individual small projects that spin out of this final topic. And then the degree can be awarded based on how, you, how well you have learned. And then you can defend yourself how much you have learned and now what you can do with the, the knowledge. And that is where how we think can be more useful because no one will tell you what to think. You do it yourself. So, so that is... There's some advantage to the um, prestigious universities that do attract a lot of research money, particularly in the sciences, um, all of the kinds of sciences, because they're usually looking for people to help with research, even undergraduates, yeah. but certainly anybody in any kind of graduate program. They're really, you know, this is how a lot of people manage to earn a bit of extra money too through university. It's not so prevalent in the arts. Those kinds of research projects tend to be an individual doing something, you know, as we did. Yeah, yeah. But I think that 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 a lot of the science research projects really are very stimulating. And you have the consciousness of being 
part of something really important. I mean, I, I know people who Tekla, who was involved in research projects where which are now so famous that you know she in her sixties now is going to annual reunions of people who were international annual reunions of people who were involved in that particular project just became very famous. She's in her 70s now. I know. No, no, no. Absolutely. Yeah, this is the beauty of that. It's a lifelong, really yes. lifelong. But one yes. of the other things I was going to say is that, that I mean, for me, I always reckon that the academic aspect of being in the university was only half the business. Exactly. Mm -hmm. the, there was a lot elsewhere to the university and a lot of other things you could engage in and learn from. I mean, I was very involved like student associations. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of looking at my career, that was at least as useful as the degree I got. <laughs> yeah. And I used to be selecting people for clinical psychology, mm -hmm. doctorate training. It's very competitive. And they would come along for their interview and they would talk about you know, their degree. And I say, Well, I know you've got first class on this degree, otherwise yes. you'd be sitting there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But what I'm interested in is what else have you done? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that is what I keep telling my students. You think you have a degree that is enough, that is only an entry ticket to be considered a job. Everybody looking for that job, applying, they have the equivalent degree. Yes. Otherwise, they're not going to consider you. But what you need to present is what can you, you know, what value can you add them? What other things have you done apart from the degree and that piece of paper? But they don't see it that way. So that is why I keep telling my EFO students, degree is only one thing. Degree is essential. But that doesn't guarantee a job. You know, there's always less job opening than the number of applications. Mm -hmm. Always the case. On, on this point, right, it brings to mind the story of a, a, a guy I knew who he said, so he was a very skilled tradesperson. He said he used to be able to go up to work sites and stand outside and they would come to the gates and go, you, 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 you. Can you do this? Mm. You can, right, you're in. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So on the employment, you know, entrepreneurial side, is there a responsibility of enterprises and enterprise owners not to be reading CVs, but to be going, okay, come in, can you do this? Yeah. Show, That's illustrate your, yeah. your, show me your skills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot yeah. of businesses certainly like to have people doing they always things in the like, summer, they, yeah, you know, yeah. to get, you know, they want to eyeball you and if you're any good, um, they're very, very keen on thinking maybe when you finally get your qualification, you Yeah, know, yeah, because they can see first hand their yes. yeah. Well, actually, that is why as an important stakeholder, corporates should take on the role to shape what education should be about mm -hmm. since it's a product thing, you know, we meet the market, which is the labor market. Then if the employers start demanding, this is the type of graduates we need, you need to do something about that. Or at least, you know, the statistics will show this school's graduates are more popular or demanded by employers than the others. And that is a warning sign. So sometimes it's really coming from a push side. Yes. Then it might make the university see okay, they need to do something rather than just follow the mainstream. Mm. And uh, um, hopefully, you know, that is the, the, the start of the turn. But at this moment, even employers are at loss yes. to some extent, <laughs> what they need. And then with the, what the kind of, you know, uncertain economic prospects, there's mm. also a lot of, you know, concerns falling back into the traditional business uh, focus, the money talk all the operating side of, you know, how to, you know, avoid have more humans to increase the AI implication, you know, the application, all that kind of thing. But I, I am in a way skeptical, but I'm in a way optimistic. I think mm -hmm. over the time, this, this kind of chaos will always bring in a new set of order in the society and then maybe will restore what university should really be about. What did Jen say? Pendulum swing this way, yeah, it goes the other way. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> over time we will reach that balance. Yeah. Well, the important thing is the pendulum doesn't stop. Exactly, <laughs> well, they will never stop, I'm sure of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't want to go back to 
no. an era when only 5% of, the, no. of no. the population has a crack at higher education. I certainly wouldn't advocate that, but I mean, no. one of the questions that arises in my mind is, is university necessarily the best place for people? learning things. Yes. And there's been well, researchers recently looking yeah, at things yes. like you know, employment-based training, for example, apprenticeships. Yeah. Yes. And saying for some people, sending them to an academic institution it's is a complete pointless. waste. Yeah. Exactly. And very tough on them. Yeah. 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 And they would be much better if they were learning something practical. Yeah. That Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That is why the post-92 universities is losing their sense. You know, yes. They're not up yes. to compete with the actual academic institutes. They should be focusing on preparing you know, a different kind of prospect employee. Yeah, because like everybody is useful in the society. We need all kinds of jobs. Yes. And who says a cleaner cannot learn and then cannot make their job better? Yes. If they acquire necessary cognitive skills, they can do that job better as well. So any job is necessary. But this kind of university idea has driven a lot of people thinking that is the life I want to be. I don't want to. I don't want this kind of life. I want to change my life, but they might not have the capability of changing that life. So rather than giving them this kind of ideology to chase, maybe make them, you know, utilize this way. You know, make them capable. You know, become some uh, some someone they are capable of doing. I mean, you know, doing have to something look back 150 years. And engineers were not trained at university, and yet we have yeah. some incredible feats of engineering. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they they were really trained on the job, yeah. and I'm sure that quite a lot of people yeah. would far prefer that. They, yeah. you know, they like getting really involved in something and something difficult. Yeah. So I'm a practical reminder, actually, this week because I was getting my windows painted. I was talking to a painter who said. He had tried to get into university and had not been accepted for university. So he was never really academic and mm -hmm. you know, didn't get the requirement for mm -hmm. uh, A levels or hires or whatever. And he was talking about you know, how his business had developed. Mm -hmm. So I was saying, just out of interest, what's your annual income? Mm -hmm. And he said, Oh, about 175. <laughs> 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 what? what? <laughs> Why did I go to university? I shouldn't have paid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that is actually like they, they use that as a benchmark, but they forget, you know, that everybody can be excellent in their own way. Yeah. It's just a matter of making people find that suitable path rather than, you know, this is almost like in China, you have to go through that bridge and to the university or you are yes. not successful. But no, yes. you can be successful. Okay, in China, maybe not the case, but in the UK, other countries, certainly, the society allows anybody to become somebody they are better off, but not become somebody else, but because becomes they, themselves a real self to fully utilize that. So, also, I, yeah, I'm we have the great. I think it's helped to have the philosophy that's grown in the last, you know, many hundred years that. You're not necessarily finished when you're 21. Right? Absolutely. Not. You know, <laughs> if you decide to go to university when you're 50, as I did, I mean, for the second time, um, yeah. then there's opportunities. You're not barred just yeah. because you're not a young person or it's not your first choice or whatever. So I think that's. Yeah, so that is the, yeah, the lifelong learning, and that yes. is also how we can live through longer life you know, yes. expectancy. If we don't learn, I mean, how we boring are life will be. In their 40s, <clears throat> 50s, going to medical school now. And that's marvelous. People who've perhaps had a different career or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they go back to do it. Yes. What was your, what was your I went back to do linguistics. Oh, wow. Well. Which is, you know. I think it's the most fast. It's like if you're not bright enough to do medicine, I think <laughs> because it's anything. I mean, it's you know how children are taught language, or it's higher maths. I mean, really, really very math at the top, yeah. and everything in between. Yeah. How people can do that. The way that the qualification, the sort of credential system, yeah, has evolved. I'm, I'm really wondering whether. So the industrial policy is is is, uh, is enabling the culture.
to value it, see value where it is. Mm. I don't think it is. You're right. And I think this idea that we, mu that we must all be at university because mm. that's the prestigious thing. That's the thing that, you know, my, my son, the doctor, my daughter, the lawyer kind of thing. Um, and I think that other things we need as a, as a certain society to begin to value each other. Yeah, well, I think university value, the degree is devalued. Because uh, there's an article in uh, Spectator uh, a few months ago talking about if you go into McDonald's, you know, the, the number of customer service assistants who have a first degree at university is, you know, much more prevalent than before. So, well, you have a university degree, but the job you're doing is definitely not matching supposedly the level of that degree. You're doing a job that any high school graduates can do, or maybe even 16 years old can do. And so, so for that whole thing, it makes the university degree really pointless. And this product will have less and less value over the time. Well, it's interesting, because I mean, when I first went to university, most people got a degree. And the idea of going on to, to get an honours degree was an extra year. Yeah, yeah. Most people didn't do that. <laughs> Because, you know, that, you had to be really good to do the honours yep. degree. And then it became, you know, okay, you've got your honours degree, so you do a master's degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. now, you know, you not only do the master's degree, you then go on to do a doctorate. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would have been completely unthinkable yes. in my you know, yeah. days when I was doing it. But the, the thing is, you know, as you say, the degree is devalued, yep. the honours degree is devalued, the master's degree is devalued, yep. and now you've got to the doctorate. Yeah, yeah the, the, the next round. <laughs> Take care. It's interesting you, were, you mentioned about chat. Uh, um, the chat GPT. The chat GPT. I see, yeah, yeah, I, I, I see it. someone was showing a friend was showing me this. Oh, okay. Mine was absolutely blown watching them. Yeah. It's come out with all this information out of the ether. So, uh, I wonder, you know, you'd have to be a very gifted teacher to keep all of your students occupied at all times. You, you, People learn at different paces, I think, and uh, your mind wanders, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's, you know, teaching, you're trying to fit all to different lots of individuals who, who are uh, at different paces. I'm trying to think back to the university and what I would have benefited from, and I wonder, do you think the future with technology is, is like a personal um, tutor with, you know, AI and the way AI is progressing and they're, they're trying to get to this situation where AI is basically conscious. Do you think the future, uh, is, whether this does teach you a job or I don't know, but do you think you, you, know, you might get to a stage in the future where students uh, have a personal tutor through AI, where rather than, than chat producing information, you can go through the lecture with this online AI and talk to you. you understand that, but how did, how did that bit work? How did that, I missed that bit of the proof, how did that, and, and the AI can kind of talk to you exactly like the tutor would do. So, do you think that's coming in the, in the future, or? How would AI replace natural tutors if the people can actually learn better from the interface, you know, actually talking to an actual human being, you know, with the different values that they've learned through the years? Why wouldn't AI be replacing that? You know, AI is just number, like you said, ones and zeros. They're not human beings with actual experiences. Those experiences are put in. So it's better to actually speak to someone face to face. Rather than going on the internet watching a YouTube video on how to do your taxes. Mm -hmm. it, 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 some people just don't learn that way. I know I've tried it. I still don't know how to do my taxes. Mm -hmm. That's why I would rather, you know, have someone go through it with me one step by step. Yeah. And then, you know, be able to practice that. And yes, maybe AI, you know, can be beneficial, but I don't think it should be like heavy, heavily relied on, like 99% of the time. I mean, like that, that 99% should be human interaction, you know, between teachers and tutors, or students between students, and mm. teachers between teachers. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I'm with you, I'm with you the taxes as well, it's horrible. Uh, um, uh, the reason I mention it is because shooters are not only the teachers have to teach, and the classes are bigger and bigger these days, so you, you have a teacher teaching 30, 40, and I don't know what the client size of classes you've got, I mean, the, that sort of number. Are they, the, well, I have about 40, Around about 40 students. Yeah. So if it's 40 individuals who learn at different rates, you know, and we don't all kind of get all full tutors. 
So AI is one of these things potentially. I'm just uh, uh, suggesting that in the future, you, you, you know, each course should have an AI where you're uh, you're talking with the AI because it's about availability as much as anything else. You, you won't always have that time with a, with a teacher. Every, 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 every. Yeah, I think like the the kind of question I always wonder is, you know, for 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 that for that to happen, mm -hmm. the design of this program needs to deliver equivalent level of you know support. Uh, where is that quality come from? Mm. The AI itself cannot generate that. So unless if no, you no, say presently. not presently. Yeah. So unless you're saying the AI can be in the interactive way, like when the you know the teacher is doing the teaching, mm -hmm. the information actually is captured by AI, and then the AI able to reproduce something and then respond to students' various demand. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, AI needs to understand individuals. They need to know there are individual differences and they need to have a relatively accurate estimation of their learning behavior, learning habit, how they can, uh, you know, acquire knowledge better. And then what is their writing habit, how they can provide that support for that level of sophistication. I doubt any programmer can really make that AI facility available. And not. Well, it's interesting. I have to be involved in some of that. Uh, in the area of AI, or well, at least artificial therapy mm -hmm. and psychological therapy. And certainly at the moment, if you look at things like ChatGPT and so on, they are a long way from being uh, you know, the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. Apart from the answer, they're often inaccurate because they're only as good as the information you've been given. Yeah. And sometimes they'll draw in information from inappropriate sources and they'll give you a wrong answer. Yeah. Uh, but that is advancing all the time. But in the area that I'm interested in, just looking at people using AI therapists, mm. there's been quite a lot of progress. And the interesting thing is that, that people uh, do feel you could actually relate to the AI therapist. Now, again, at the moment, that's relatively rudimentary. But it goes back to the, the very first thing, was a thing called the ELISA program, which was in the 1970s, I think. The guy produced a program which basically was based on the idea of repeating things back to you. Mm. So you say, I'm terribly worried about my life. <laughs> Programs say, oh, you're terribly worried about my life. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm having trouble with my son. Oh, you're having trouble with your son. <laughs> and he produced this just as a bit of amusement. But he got his secretary to try it out. Uh, and after a while, he came in to see how the secretary was going on. She said, go away, go away. I'm really, I'm really into oh, this. Okay. And that was at such a simple level. And in fact, there's been a lot of stuff looking at empathic responses, being trained into AI, being able to pick up subtle cues about behavior, even being able to pick up things like facial expression and so on, which is suggesting that we are heading down the line of people being able to talk to an AI of some sort uh, and accept it as human. I mean, the Turing test always can you tell the difference between a human and the, the robot. And, and you know, I find it quite fascinating because I would have said having been a therapist for most of my life, you know, you can't replace that. The human contact is really important. People are looking at me now and saying, well, maybe that was true in your day, but and it is changing. But like my my idea of about the AI is that I'm still well I think that certainly is, I'm sure is one of the things if AI is purposely used in certain areas, then the level of data input will be in a way controlled by the specialists who are in the area, like the, the AI therapy. So it's obviously the data set, the database will be built up by the specialist in the field. And then capturing the, the experiences probably, you know, of different counselors, different psychologists. And then yes, AI can process that information fairly fast in a way looking at, you know, the generic or maybe the mass cases that you have all encountered. But the next thing is AI, well, AI can be a good supporting means, means of support, but AI certainly wouldn't overtake the human side. Because after all, there are yet new cases to be discovered, new ideas to be generated, and maybe even new knowledge to be upgraded. AI can't do that. AI can only serve as a recording or maybe reproduction of what has already been done. So from this perspective, it is still under the human control 
So if we can control the type of humans who controls the AI, maybe we can control the actual quality of the AI integrated uh, services, either learning or therapy, or even they have AI uh, facilitated art creation. So that is quite, you know, uh, common now. It's, it's not unusual. So yes, you know, we even have the robotic operations, you know, really doing the very, very fine operations. But still, that is the accumulation of the specialist knowledge and combining with the technology uh, design. So it's actually cross-discipline product. It can't just happen one-sided without the other side. So again, it's the human power we are talking about. It's the brain power. On the front of AI, just to add this into the mix, so I've, I've been um, helping mentor students at the University of Manchester thinking about sustainable educational technology development. And uh, the, what, uh, the, the other mentor worked for Microsoft and looking at the cost of AI, the, the energy and the resources that were required to run these technologies, can the world afford mm. that? Like Microsoft for the next year are building two data centers per week. Now, data centers that are drawing water to, you know, from ground sources to cool them, they're running, you know, a data center will use, uh, AI will use like the, the equivalent energy of a city. And, and all of that energy has both a carbon footprint, but also it, it produces disease causing pollution in our air. So I'm, I'm just wondering, obviously it's got its place, but when we start using AI to open doors or tell you whether you know you should order milk yeah. from your fridge, all that has a, a, a cost. Yeah, the energy consumption. Yeah. 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 So potentially breaking the ecological balance. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that was really, yeah, really nice. Thank yeah, you. thank you very, very much, much for being here as well. I think, yeah, really it's enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. I, I, you know, I felt quite anxious of making sure that I'm not talking nonsense only just. So, so this is actually the, the, the trial, and I'm really glad to hear, you know, there are people out there really interested in how education should be about, and it's not just, you know, uh, not, not just a small number, I'm sure with this more and more opening up the dialogue, I certainly hope to get more people share the thoughts and then inquiry. This is how philosophy started, through the inquiry, just discussion, that's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Do you know about the democratic intellect? Uh, a book by George Elder Davy uh, is the, the history of the, the, this uh, the origins of the Scottish universities, uh, and it takes from the continental tradition, where um, effectively all subjects are united in philosophy, and students were uh, free to draw from all subject areas, and of course learned all subject areas to build. And uh, I think the litmus was. Uh, does the argument make sense? But it really pushed people out to, to learn, not just in a very specious, specialized way. So the, the chemist would know much more about biology and physics and so on and so forth. So are, are we due to go back towards a more interdisciplinary World. Yeah, yeah, we already you know like they're talking all the time, although they're not doing as much as they talk, but the notion is there. And the naturally, whatever uh, you know, a lot of research, even the research councils are pushing this kind of cross-discipline agenda. They prefer it when you have a cross-discipline. And uh, I think like over the time, hopefully this will be shaped into a more, uh, you know, purposefully rather than just fulfilling the, you know, the the founders' uh, 
agenda and then also just to you know to fulfill this instrumental value okay i have somebody from another field but actually they genuinely work together and i think like i believe every knowledge is connected you just need to find that connection and then recreate something new so that is how knowledge can be you know so that's why you know people should know more than the old time and then students should know more because when you learn different knowledge you might be able to generate some new ideas based on the existing knowledge uh, you know the the categories so maybe you know new thing that is how theories came up it's just yeah the the evolution of the the old knowledge and re consolidation of the, the understanding there's an interesting story i heard of a a, a, a conversation with a, a soviet political scientist after uh, after the cold war and the, one of the questions that the what was put to them was what 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 do you think made the difference to uh, that um, you know the, the West really sort of seemed to win on certain fronts mm -hmm. and uh, the, the response was something like the the USSR had been so teleological so instrumental and defined. We are all going to put all of our resources into these very specific targets. Whereas in the States, there was a lot more latitude for people going off into corners and thinking about theoretical maths. And, well, we don't know what the point of thinking about this is. But out of that came chaos theory, and out of that came compression and the computer chip. From people, you know, bogging and being bogging. So when you're you're telling everybody, right, everybody has to think about this and only this. They are told what to think. <laughs> you you create a very fragile yep. Yep. Uh, system because it's very specific. That is China as well. China even now. Sending students abroad for that very reason because yep. they discovered. Through the Chinese educational system, they were not innovative, they were not inventive. Yeah. And had, as you say, memorized yeah. things rather yeah. than learn things. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea was you send the students abroad because they get a wider spectrum yeah. of things but and come might. back to China yeah. and begin to introduce new ideas. <laughs> yeah. But they still can't learn, although they are exposed to the, the wealth of knowledge, that the mind is not trained or prepared for that. Yeah. yeah. It's just like the machines, machinery from Germany. One Chinese company is buying them, and then when uh, uh, the German company go to do the post service kind of service uh, visit, they realize the Chinese company is not even using the machine to you know only twenty percent of the efficiency they are using that machine. So they're not really using that to the full capacity because they don't have the the manpower and the 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 brain power to operate that and to see how that can create. So it's all you know based on your planned production. And especially for state-owned enterprises, they have to produce based on what you are told. And then the machine is much underused. And it's just a waste of the money and the time. But yet, they are doing it. Yeah, they, they know it is you know, a lot of good things in the West, but they don't know how they can utilize it. So they set on the knowledge. They can't produce anything out of it. That is actually the, the unfortunate part. So, you know... I'm not afraid of spies coming to, you know, because they can steal something, but they can't use it. They just can't use it. So hopefully the government will realize that, if ever. So, yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it really is my pleasure. Um, and just a heads up, I've had a confirmation that on the 12th, We've got... Uh...